Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for waiting to the very end. Uh, it's a great honor for me to speak at this memorial for uh, Lev Gorkov. Uh, I didn't know him very well, but of course I was very influenced by reading the Bible, of, as many people have mentioned. I think the first time I met him was uh, at a place that no one's mentioned so far, which was for a while the Landau Institute had moved to Torino in Italy, uh, and I gave a talk there. And while I was giving a talk, a big discussion broke out between, in the audience. And uh, I was just standing quietly, and the discussion went on. And only later on, I learned this is very normal for the Landau Institute. <laughs> OK, so uh, I want to talk about uh, um, strange or bad or incoherent metals that many people have mentioned. Uh, and these are ubiquitous in many materials uh, and have a linear resistivity, and sometimes uh, a large resistance much greater than the Mortier of Eregel value. Uh, in particular, uh, there's been some very beautiful recent experiments, uh, one by the group of, uh, of gym analytics at Berkeley and another uh, mag lab group uh, in the nictides and, and in the cuprates, looking at the magneto resistance, the longitudinal magneto resistance. And, and what they see uh, is a linear magneto resistance over a wide range of fields uh, above HC2. And furthermore, the scale of this linear magneto resistance, at least in the uh, paper of uh, Analytus, can be described by this very simple formula. The change in resistance due to temperature or magnetic field is roughly the same uh, and, and can be fit very well by this quadrature form. So there really is no model that can, uh, as far as I know, that can explain this, and, but we'll engineer a very simple model, which will be sort of a bit of an, it'll have lots of artifacts, but I think it gives some insights into what the possible origins of this behavior. Okay, so of course there's been a huge amount of work on theories of strange metals. Uh, one very wide class of theories, which I also have worked on a great deal, uh, are theories where you start with the Fermi surface of quasi-particles, and then you couple them to some low energy, long wavelength bosonic mode, could be uh, an auto parameter, could be a gauge field, uh, and then you end up breakdown of quasi-particles uh, and, and you get a non-Fermi liquid state. However, in all of these theories, if you look at where the breakdown of quasi-particles comes, it comes from long wavelength processes which can be represented in the continuum, uh, which means that the singular processes are all from a theory that conserves momentum, uh, which means ultimately that these theories uh, as far as their singular contribution resistivity is concerned, have zero resistance uh, because of the conservation of momentum. Um, so to get any momentum, you have to think seriously uh, about uh, breaking momentum conservation by umklaut processes, for example, and this Im immediately leads to rather weak effects, uh, and no way it can give the kind of linear resistivity that's so commonly seen. So you have to look elsewhere for an understanding of uh, the strange metal problem, I believe. It can't be given by these long wavelength theories. Uh, you can look at the effects of disorder, and of course, again, uh, starting as Sasha described, there's been a lot of very beautiful work on the effects of interaction and disorder uh, in metals. Uh, typically, this treats uh, interactions in a Fermi liquid way while treating disorder more carefully. Uh, and uh, the, the general conclusion is that there are two basic types of fixed points. There's a metallic fixed point uh, where um, uh, you, you can almost define fermionic quasi-particles in 2D and 3D you certainly can. Um, and, uh, and then you get flow to strong disorder. And the usual assumption is you flow to some insulator. But perhaps there's some other fixed point uh, in the phase space of strongly interacting systems uh, with disorder. And that would be a fixed point where you have some moderate amount of disorder, uh, but which is largely self-averaging. It's not so strong that you get spin glass or, or localized behavior. Uh, but nevertheless, quasi-particles don't exist. So the interaction is strong enough that quasi-particles don't exist. So what I want to talk about today are very simple models of this type of fixed point. They're not particularly realistic, but they could be useful fixed points, or mean field fixed points to study, which may have some unstable directions. Uh, as a way of understanding what's going on in, uh, in not only in experiments, but also perhaps in very sophisticated numerical calculations of the type that uh, Gabby described. 
Um, okay, so these are the so-called SYK models. So let me just describe the simplest SYK model. Uh, so this is a model of, let's take N sites in, uh, in some region. So we'll think of this eventually as some, uh, uh, some multi-orbital atom, if you wish, or it could be a nucleus. In fact, this model was discussed by a nuclear physicists in the 80s, but they didn't really solve it. Uh, so on, this, uh, on these N sites, or these n orbitals, you put a few electrons, and now you allow them to interact with each other, uh, or let me represent that by, in the case of spinless electrons, uh, as particles moving from one orbital to the other. Uh, and, and the basic rule is that they always move in pairs. Now, if they were to move singly, this would become a random matrix model, but you don't allow that, you only allow them to move in pairs. Uh, and to make the model solvable, you take the amplitude for every one of these processes, which is in the spirit of the Huns couplings that Kavio was talking about, really, uh, to be just a random number. Uh, so there's an, a very large number of orbitals, and there's an, a random set of Huns type couplings, which uh, move uh, electrons in pairs. Okay, so that's the very simple model. Uh, you can write it down uh, explicitly here. Uh, so you go from, electrons go from site K and site L to site I and J with a four index random number. You can put in spin and you can, uh, there's many variations, but this is the simplest case. Uh, so you wanted to get the simplest case, you want the average of these U's to be zero. Uh, they don't have to be Gaussian, but they should be independent. Uh, and all you need is a second moment of these U's. So now if you take this particular model and take the large end limit, uh, it's described by acidal point equations, which are written right here. Uh, basically, the self-energy of the electron Green's function is the, is the cube of the full renormalized Green's function. So this is, uh, has the spirit of a DMFT equation, but it's really a baby DMFT. It's much, much simpler than the type of equations that uh, Gabby was writing down. And you can solve many things analytically, but, but not everything. It's still quite complicated. So among the things you find just by solving these equations at any, uh, any density uh, is that the Green's function at low, en uh, uh, at low energies is, is singular, uh, or in, in, in time it decays as one over square root of time, at large time, at zero temperature. Uh, and uh, if a Fermi liquid, we have a one over tau because of a constant density of states. Uh, a few years later, uh, George and Parcolet showed that you could actually solve these equations exactly in the low temperature limit at non-zero temperature. And what happens then, uh, this was, a, this was a, quite a surprise, you get a form that you get in conformal field theories. Today we understand this much better, but I won't have time to explain that. Uh, and so this one over square root of tau becomes this function. And here I just want to note the important point that the characteristic frequency scale at which the square root of tau singularity gets rounded out, if you wish, uh, is basically kBT over h bar. Uh, it's independent of u. So, uh, so there's some, today, there's fancy things called out of time autocorrelation functions, uh, which again show this precise uh, kBT over h bar frequency scale. Uh, in fact, what we did more recently to look, solve the Schinger Keldish equations for a non equilibrium problem and again, do find numerically uh, this same basic time scale. Uh, you could take the Fourier transform of this and look at the electron Green's function. Uh, and if you look at the imaginary part, this is for a particle hole asymmetric case. Uh, it has this one over square root of omega singularity, which gets rounded out and becomes everything becomes smooth on the scale of just kT. All right, so the main thing to remember here is this one over square root of omega singularity. That's, that's going to be extremely important for uh, the linear resistivity that I'm going to show you. Uh, so there's various extension of this to, to a full lattice. Uh, and one very nice way of putting it uh, is this paper of Song et al. Uh, but very closely related results for a different model, a little more artificial model, were obtained by George and Parcolet in 99. So here, uh, I've taken the, the SYK dot that I just described and put it in this one circle. So each circle here has n orbitals. So this is like a multi-orbital atom. Uh, and I'm going to take the limit. The only limit I'm going to take is, to, is the number of orbitals goes to infinity. That's it. Now, 
the model that uh, uh, Song et al. solved uh, has each has this UIJKL different on every atom and random, and also the hopping matrix elements, your, ele your electrons to hop between atoms with some amplitude t, and they also took t to be a random number. Now, none of that is actually necessary. Uh, there's a forthcoming work by Sentil et al., Sentil, Erisberg, and Debant and Chaudhry, uh, which solve the model in which there's complete translation invariance. Uh, they just take the large n limit with uh, random numbers on a single atom, but the same random numbers on every atom. But I'll just talk about the simpler case. All right, so, so again, this model with only the large n limit, but an infinite lattice, uh, in many orbital atom. Uh, you can write down the equations, and these are the DMFT equations, which are just a little more complicated. Everything is independent of momentum. Uh, and what you find in these equations uh, is that there is a coherent scale, and below this coherent scale, Fermi liquid behavior ap uh, appears. So there's a coherent scale EC, and that turns out to be not T, as you might naively guess, but T squared over U. Uh, so it's suppressed at large U. Uh, and below this, you get heavy Fermi liquid behavior. And presumably, in a realistic system, you would then cross over uh, to the type of physics that uh, Sasha discussed of a disordered interacting Fermi liquid. Uh, but the interest here is in the uh, temperatures above this coherent scale, a T bigger than EC, where you can again solve everything. Uh, and in particular, in this, uh, this higher temperature scale, above the coherent scale, if you compute the conductivity, this is the basic formula. Uh, this, this is the electron spectral function, uh, which has this 1 over square root of omega singularity I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, this gets you know, rounded out by this f of omega over t. That's, that's also known exactly. You can do this integral, and you just count powers. In, using this 1 half, what you get is a 1 over temperature behavior of the conductivity or a linear resistivity. So the linear resistivity here is not coming from some classical Bose function, limit of a Bose function, as in some very low energy phonon. Uh, it's really coming from quantum critical behavior of this particular uh, uh, SYK type model, this one over square root of omega behavior. Uh, OK. Now, so that's nice. Uh, but this is a really, uh, uh, this type of conductivity isn't coming, you know, also I forgot to mention. Also, this resistance here is much bigger than h over e squared. So it's a bad metal. Uh, but it's coming in a regime where the Green's function is essentially local because of the randomness. Uh, and if you then look at the effect of a magnetic field, the orbital effect of a magnetic field, it's completely negligible. So there's no way this model can explain the magneto resistance data I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my talk. So now I'm going to talk about a very recent work, uh, mostly led actually by my student Avishkar Patel, uh, also in collaboration with John McGreevy and Daniel Arovas. So what we do here is take a very similar model uh, of a bunch of lattice of SYK dots. So these are multi-orbital atoms with n orbitals per atom. But now we take a second band of coherent electrons. So the green here represents uh, the C electrons which have a non-random hopping. Uh, and then this is the SYK model of the F electrons, which are these blue dots. So this is a condo lattice model, where instead of having independent spins on each side, uh, you have this multi-orbital atom with a large number of orbitals on each side. And that's interacting with the uh, path of conduction electrons. Again, you can make this model completely non-random. It's a little more complicated. Uh, and that's going to be, I believe, described, although I haven't seen the paper uh, by these authors uh, to appear very shortly. And my understanding is their results are fairly similar. OK, so what do you get in this model? Uh, so here's the set of DMFT type equations, which you can largely solve analytically. Uh, and now, as a function of temperature, there are two regimes. Uh, there's this IM, or the incoherent metal regime, at relatively high temperatures, when the G is the, con oh, sorry, the condo exchange, T is the hopping, J is uh, what Gabby would call the Huns rule coupling. So in this incoherent metal regime, uh, it's very similar to the model of Leon Balance that I mentioned earlier. Everything is local. The resistivity is linear in temperature. Oh, sorry. Uh, and 
that, and it's much bigger than h over e squared. But, so that's this one. But more interesting for the magneto resistance uh, is this lower temperature regime, which is a marginal Fermi liquid regime. And here what happens is that the electrons, conduction electrons scattering off the SYK dots uh, do give you this omega log, omega marginal Fermi liquid self-energy. Uh, uh, and, and here, so there is more of a coherent electronic conduction. Now, the interesting point is that even in this regime, uh, the resistivity is linear in temperature, although the mechanism is a bit different. So there's the uh, incoherent metal conductivity, which is uh, 1 over T, as is the marginal Fermi liquid regime, uh, 1 over T, but with a, with a different slope. So there could be some slight kink uh, in the slope as you increase the temperature. Okay, so, so the main calculation is the effect of a magnetic field uh, on this marginal Fermi liquid regime with coherent conduction on a single band. So there is some momentum dependence uh, in the Green's function there. So for that band of electrons, uh, we can write down a Boltzmann type equation and a fairly standard analysis gives you expression for the longitudinal and the Hall conductivities. Uh, the basic result that comes out of this uh, which is in retrospect not that surprising, is that both conductivities scale as 1 over temperature, as I've already shown you, times some function of B over T. Uh, so this is coming from the orbital effect entirely, and it's B over T rather than B over T squared, as would be the case in a Fermi liquid, uh, because of this uh, marginal Fermi liquid self-energy. Okay. Now, that's not enough to explain the linear magneto resistance. What this can explain is the B over T scaling. But it doesn't tell you, in fact, if you take this formula and compute the magneto resistance at large B, they'll go as B squared. Uh, but although it scales as B over T, the dependence, if you look at the asymptotic forms of this function and invert the matrix, you'll get a B squared behavior. So what we have to do is to combine this type of microscopics, if you wish, uh, of uh, marginal Fermi liquid behavior with B over T scaling uh, with some mesoscopic disorder. And here we follow a lot of work, We're starting with work of Dickney and uh, something that Peter Littlewood worked on uh, and uh, uh, Shafiq Adam recently. Uh, and in this model, what, what we, we imagine that locally we have physics as described, but then there's global inhomogeneities, which we can describe by essentially classical Ohm's laws. So you just solve the Kirchhoff equations, but allowing for sigma x to have some randomness and an off-diagonal component. So this, this type of problem has been analyzed in great detail in many of these papers, uh, and we, we basically use those results and combine them with, with these results obtained from a more microscopic analysis. So if you do that, you, get, uh, you do get, in fact, uh, uh, the linear magneto resistance is large B, and also the B over T scaling. And roughly the answer, the reason this happens is when you have an inhomogeneous in sample uh, and you say you want to drive, apply voltages over here and here, I should have put, sorry, this is a picture from a paper by Parrish and Littlewood, I, I don't have the reference, apologize for that. Uh, so uh, this is a picture of the current flow just by solving these equations. Uh, I had the reference in the previous slide. Uh, and what you find is because of Lorentz force, there's a, uh, the current flow has a, you know, uh, has a regime where it flows transversely, and the length of this regime increases linearly with H, uh, and that's why you pick up a linear magneto resistance. Uh, okay, so there's an effective median theory that Avishkar worked out, and in some simple approximations, uh, some simple model of the mesoscopic disorder, we can also get this T squared plus P squared behavior. All right, so that's, uh, let me then summarize the results of this calculation. How am I doing on time? Five minutes, over, two, okay, great. Uh, so what we have done, you know, you may not, it looks like a rather artificial model if you wish, but it's the only model I know so far that works. Uh, we've engineered a model of where you have these, uh, it's a condo lattice type model where each spin has been replaced by this a more collective object in, in the large end limit, uh, where you have n orbitals. Uh, and this leads to marginal Fermi liquid physics with a linear and T resistance and a magneto resistance scales as B over T. Um, 
you need then you need magne uh, then you uh, then you need mesoscopic disorder to get the linear in B magneto resistance at large B, uh, and at higher temperatures in this model you get a somewhat different physics where there's negligible magneto resistance, uh, but bad metal behavior with the linear T resistance. So I want, just want to take a few minutes to speculate on how this might actually be related to something real. Uh, first of all, the, the equations that I wrote down were derived in the large disorder limit, uh, but they're really essentially DMFT equations, uh, and they can also be derived for non-random models in this particular large end limit. Uh, and I view them as sort of limiting cases of more sophisticated complete equations of the type that Gabby and others have been solving. But these limiting cases are very useful because they allow you to really focus in on some new, analytically focus on a fixed point that you can understand. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then of course the real system has many other effects that we have left out. The other thing I want to mention, ask is, you know, uh, is it possible that this kind of two component behavior could appear even in a single band Hubbard model. I mean, uh, what I'm solving here is some large orbital limit of a Hubbard model, if you wish. Uh, can a single band Hubbard model end up with some physics like this? And I just want to conclude by just showing some pictures from, well, some very old work from my old days in Bell Labs, uh, in, from the studies of phosphodoped silicon. So people were studying uh, in those days the metal insulated transition phosphodoped silicon. So this is the other phosphorus atoms with one uh, electron bound to each of them. And as you increase the density of the atom, there's a transition from a more insulator to a, to a metal. But what was found is that when you look at the spin susceptibility uh, of, this, uh, of this material, as you uh, went across the metal insulator transition, uh, you saw no sign at all. Uh, it seemed as if the, the insulating case and the metallic case uh, all had a diverging low temperature spin susceptibility. Uh, and the, the understanding was what happened was in the presence of disorder, this Hubbard model you know, separated into two components roughly, uh, where you had some, some regions say like this region behaving like a free spin and other regions having conduction electrons. And, uh, and the hope is that perhaps I mean, if, you, you know, if you look at this more carefully that you can end up in some regime with a type of um, fixed point that I have described. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Let's start. Uh, I want to say that at the level at the level of uh, uh, momentum independent or single impurity models with uh, decorations I know of at least three other models yes. that would give uh, at least uh, marginal Fermi liquid, which uh, none of which I believe are relevant for. All right. Uh, well, I uh, okay. I find you. I also to know. I also know a model uh, which uh, uh, gives these answers uh, without having to do much. Uh, uh, gymnastics. Uh, okay. Uh, what I <laughs> wanted to understand was you had to, you see there's another very, this is a very remarkable and peculiar thing about <coughs> this magneto resistance. There is evidence that the uh, current flowing along the magnetic field, so C-axis resistance with magnetic field along the C-axis also is linear in B. Okay. So that it cannot be a, a Lorentz force effect. No, no, this is something I've discussed. Okay, I mean, they have, they have data as a function of angle, and I'm pretty no, convinced no, it is a Lorentz force effect. It's okay. a function of angle, but there's an extra thing. And yes. This is, this is the most remarkable thing. Okay. That it is the same with about the same slope, mm -hmm. whether the current is flowing in the plane with magnetic field perpendicular to the plane, or current is playing along the magnetic field okay. with the perpendicular. Okay. All right, so fine. Okay. Uh, and that's a very remarkable thing. And okay, I don't have I an explanation for that. <laughs> yes. So when you had to finally put the inhomogeneous system yes. uh, to, to get that slope of linear in H for a given yeah. slope, you needed some disorder. 
what did it do to your resist ordinary resistivity? Well, I'm talking about the longitudinal magnetoresistance. I know. Well, I'm saying, what did it do to the how much disorder you had to put to get uh, residual resistance? What, what happened to it? <laughs> okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, it, it, we didn't have to put that much disorder. just took a two-component model, and the resistance was roughly about the same in the two, two sides. You know, it's a factor of two difference in the two regions, and that's all we put in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to make a comment on your uh, motivation slide, which is your second slide. So uh, okay. Back, but, uh, <laughs> no, that was about the importance of UMCLAP and Imperial. Right, scanning, right, yeah. right. Uh, sure. Of course, I agree that, uh, you know, yes. that's something that one has to worry about. But I yes. think, at least in the context of the cuprates, yes. um, um, it is a low temperature phenomenon. I, I believe that you need to worry about it only below maybe 10 or 20 Kelvin. Okay. Uh, why is that? And the reason is that. The, the mode that you're so talking about is a very soft mode. Yes. Uh, dispersion omega goes like k cube. Yes, OK. And the umklap vector, let's yes. say, is a tenth of the Brillouin zone. Yes. You take the cube of that, you get 10 to the minus 3. OK. So the energy scale for umklap is 10 to the minus 3 of the bandwidth, which is, well, generously 10 Kelvin. Right. So I mean, I mean my so point is anything above 10 Kelvin, there's plenty of umklap. OK. So I'm not, I didn't say that you couldn't explain in a theory with large umklap. Uh, but I'm just saying the long wave in theory. Yeah, but this uh, is a long wave in theory. So well, but, this is but, the same. Wave. No, but, but if, you, if you have to put an umclub, then you have to treat the whole lattice in a self consistent no, way. There's a question about scale, or well, practical scale. Okay. So what, Look, what I'm saying is that um, above 10 Kelvin, you can have plenty of umclub no, so, to take so, care of your so, scale. So it, it, okay, well, I, mean, I agree that uh, it may well be that the final problem is is a problem where you have to take a Fermi surface coupled to a gauge field. I just feel that you can't solve that in the long wavelength limit. You do have to solve it on the lattice completely. <laughs> okay, but you do have to solve it on the lattice where in a regime where the dispersion of your whatever your bosonic mode is extends across the Brillouin zone. You have to put the lattice back in. I mean, you have to solve, you can't solve it by these continuum methods. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, um, I have a question about this result that below the energy scale, t, yeah. t square over u, you, yes. you get a Fermi liquid behavior. Yes, correct. Um, h how does that agree with Anderson localization? Well, also this is all, you know, this is at the level of Born approximation disorder, sure. So you get a, a so in that model, uh, <laughs> Right, so there are higher order corrections, which in that coherent regime, where I can just then put in correct, as I said, you have the Finkelstein theory would apply and you'll get localization if needed. So we're not, we're not going to that. Yeah, no, 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 I don't have a problem with that, but if you make a lattice of these things, yes, then, uh, then there is an issue of localization and it probably comes up exactly below this energy scale. Well, so it's, that's right, it does come up below EC, but above EC, none of that applies. Uh, so you're in this incoherent metal regime where you don't worry about all the. So what you call what you call Fermi liquid is is lo localized state or. Eventually in 2D it would could be localized. I mean who knows? I don't know what's happening there. We're not treating disorder at that level. This is all at the level of Born approximation for disorder. Uh, yeah. But but there's a well-defined intermediate scale for that model, and in fact for the other model down to zero temperature, where you don't have uh, uh, Fermi liquid behavior. Uh, yes. I'm actually commenting on. Yeah, no, I, I was going to. So your numerical studies also, I think, bear directly on this point. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, for whatever peculiar reason, we do put it on the lattice. We do see a T linear resistivity down to whatever temperature we can get to, which is probably higher than the crossover you just estimated. Well, okay. Uh, no, 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 but, but look. We, we had, no, it was unexpected based on the argument. All right, can, can, I, can I at least, no, my, my point is that, yes, you see this, and I, I would like to understand the origin of the linear resistivity you see in a simulation. My point is that if I try to understand that by starting from the continuum theory and putting in weak umklap, you will not get it. Okay. <laughs> what do you, have you done the calculation? You don't need to calculate. <laughs> <laughs> 
I've tried to do the calculation, I don't get it. We've tried, I, believe me, I've tried. If you've got it, I want to see it. <laughs> I, I have a, a question about the, the philosophy behind the approach. You, yes. You, you have this uh, random disorder which you impurity average over at the end, and you get a very beautiful set of equations that you yes. can solve. Right. So am I to take the quench random disorder as a kind of inspiration for finding field theories without quench random disorder, which will have the same effect? same physics, or how, how do you see it? What's your... I, I want to have my cake and eat it too. <laughs> that is, I mean, yes, it could be a model of disordered systems, but in fact, the original model, reason for studying all of this in lots of, lots of talks I had with Antoine George uh, was really that perhaps even non-random systems will behave the same way, it's just they are harder to deal with. Curiously enough, when you have disorder, it simplifies things a great deal. So it's just easier to work with it. Uh, and that's also true now you know, in this paper, forthcoming paper by, uh, by yeah, I mentioned this paper here by uh, Werman et al. There's no disorder in the model, except what they do is they think of this as some complex nucleus or a big composite atom with lots of uh, GIG, no, sorry, uh, these, which are some set of numbers. Now, the, the properties of one of these big uh, atoms in the limit of large number of orbitals is self-averaging. In other words, if I looked at the, I need only one sample. And then as long as I have enough orbitals, it will show the same physics uh, for some typical set of numbers. Uh, and you can take a model, we take the same typical set of numbers in every site, and you get, it's a little more complicated, equation a bit harder to solve, but you get basically the same physics. Okay, yeah. thanks very much. Okay. Thanks.